Hi, this is Michael Altos, and we're back talking about the endocrine system, steroids, NSAIDs, and acetaminophen, and this is part two. Now we're going to stop talking about steroids and instead the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or the NSAIDs. These drugs act on the COX enzymes, the cyclooxygenase enzymes. They're involved in a pathway that converts a substance called arachidonic acid into prostaglandins. There are two kinds of COX enzymes. COX-1 enzymes, which are constitutive, which means they are always operating at a constant level of activity, they have three functions that you must know. The COX-1 enzyme is involved in maintenance and protection of the gastric mucosa. It's involved in normal platelet aggregation and maintenance of renal blood flow. The COX-2 enzyme is called inducible, which means it's only expressed at sites of injury. The COX-2 enzyme is responsible for pain and inflammation. It's also responsible for fever. So when we give NSAIDs, we find that we're blocking both the COX-1 and the COX-2 enzyme. Blocking the COX-1, as we said, blocks the ability to have gastric protection, the hemostasis from platelet function, and renal function from good renal blood flow. And so we will see the side effects are related to inhibiting the COX-1 function. We will also see that there are COX-2 specific inhibitors, which really only work primarily on the COX-2 enzyme and spare the COX-1 enzyme. NSAIDs have a lot of very desirable features. They deactivate and desensitize nociceptors, which are pain receptors. They decrease the inflammatory response. Patients can't really get addicted or dependent to them like they can with opioids. They actually have synergy with opioids. They may have some role in preemptive analgesia. They don't cause any respiratory depression, very little nausea or vomiting. They have a long duration of action and don't have cognitive side effects like opioids do. The first NSAID is aspirin. Aspirin is called acetylsalicylic acid, and that's why we often abbreviate it ASA. Aspirin has analgesic effects, also antipyretic effects, which means that it decreases fever, and antiplatelet effects. The antiplatelet function of aspirin is due to irreversibly acetylating platelet COX-1. And we take advantage of this effect by giving aspirin to patients who are at risk for, or who are being treated for, MI and CVA. It's also used to prevent clots in coronary stents. If a patient's having a very invasive procedure and we want to minimize their risk of bleeding, we usually stop the aspirin for seven to 10 days before surgery, which is the life of a platelet. And that allows the old platelets to the old platelets, which are irre irreversibly blocked, to be cleared and new platelets to be synthesized. Patients who have uremia, so dialysis patients, can be especially sensitive to the bleeding effects of aspirin. Aspirin has very few renal effects compared to some of the other NSAIDs. And the most common side effects are bleeding and irritation or ulceration in the GI tract. Just to clarify, patients who take aspirin are considered safe to get epidurals, spinals, and nerve blocks. Aspirin has a side effect of bronchoconstriction, especially in patients who have asthma. And actually, this concern exists with all nonspecific NSAIDs. And so it's something to just be careful about. Aspirin is no longer used in children especially if they have any viral syndrome. And that's due to something called Rye syndrome, which is acute encephalopathy and hepatic failure, responsible for the deaths of many children, mostly in the 1980s. Hepatic hydrolysis converts aspirin into salicylic acid, at which point it's metabolized and renally excreted. Aspirin overdose leads to CNS stimulation causing hyperventilation and seizures, and the unusual combination of respiratory alkalosis 
plus metabolic al al plus metabolic acidosis. Moving on from aspirin, the next NSAID we'll discuss is ibuprofen, which goes by a number of brand names, including Motrin and Advil. Ibuprofen is an effective analgesic, antipyretic, and anti-inflammatory, metabolized in the liver. Side effects include GI irritation and ulceration, as well as platelet dysfunction. And ibuprofen will exacerbate pre-existing renal dysfunction due to the decreased renal blood flow. A related drug is called napros naprosin, or Aleve, that's naproxen. And it's pretty similar to ibuprofen, except that it's only dosed twice a day. Ketorolac, or Toradol, is available in IV and IM formulation. I should just mention that ibuprofen is also available in IV formulation at some places. Ketorolac can be used as a sole pain medication, or it can be used together with opioids. It is said that 30 milligrams of IM ketorolac is as effective against pain as 10 milligrams of, of morphine. So it does have quite a good analgesic effect. It does cause an inhibition of platelet aggregation, and it does decrease renal blood flow, especially in patients who are compromised if they're hypovolemic or have heart failure. And so usually we limit our toradol dosing to, let's say, four doses over the course of 24 hours, and then no more. Its peak effect is in about 45 to 60 minutes, and it's almost completely protein bound. Can NSAIDs be used in pregnancy and in children? Well, we don't recommend them during pregnancy, especially during the third trimester, for a couple reasons. Not only is there a risk of bleeding, but remember that the fetus has the ductus arteriosus that allows bypass of the lungs and NSAIDs can cause premature closure of the ductus arteriosus. In addition, NSAIDs limit renal blood flow. They've been linked to premature birth and miscarriage, and most pregnant ladies don't take NSAIDs. Can they be used in children? Most of our pediatric colleagues are comfortable using them in children after the age of six months old. So all of the NSAIDs we've discussed so far block both COX-1 and COX-2. And so we saw the three side effects associated with COX-1 blockade, the renal, the gastric, and the platelet effects. Other drugs are COX-2 specific inhibitors. The one you're most likely to see is Celebrex or Celecoxib, used in the treatment of the pain and inflammation of arthritis and surgery. It's very well absorbed from the GI tract with very little first pass metabolism. And it's considered safer for patients who have gastritis or gastric ulcers. It has very little antiplatelet effect, and it's also better tolerated by patients with asthma. It's metabolized in the liver and excreted renally. Interestingly, other COX-2 specific inhibitors like Vioxx and Bextra were withdrawn from the market because of their risk of MI and CVA. That's interesting because we think of NSAIDs as causing bleeding, and it seems that if your COX-2 inhibition is too specific, you may actually have some prothrombotic events. And this is a very interesting chart that shows how COX-2 selective various drugs are. So on one end of the spectrum, we have ketorolac, which is not very COX selective at all. And as we move up on the chart to drugs that are more and more COX selective, naproxen, ibuprofen, and now here's Celebrex, and the drugs that were taken off the market we're up in this range. And so we see that too much COX-2 selectivity may be undesirable, and we want to have a balance. The last drug we're going to discuss is actually not an NSAID. It's Tylenol, acetaminophen, which is an analgesic and an antipyretic, but not a true NSAID because it's not really anti-inflammatory. The mechanism of Tylenol is not completely understood, but it seems to have an effect inside the CNS. And there is some COX-2 or maybe COX-3 inhibition, so it is complicated. Acetaminophen has excellent synergy with opioids and no effects on gastric irritation or platelet function.
Acetaminophen is metabolized in the liver, and it has a, and therefore it has a first pass effect when given orally. At high doses, some toxins are formed, including paraaminophenol, which is nephrotoxic, and N-acetyl-P-benzoquinone, which is hepatotoxic. It is well known that patients can develop hepatic necrosis if they overdose on aspirin. I, I'm sorry, on acetaminophen, and that would be exceeding the dose of four grams per day. Some are now recommending three grams a day. Patients who are chronic alcohol users are already having increased cytochrome P450 activity due to their alcohol use and decreased glutathione stores. And therefore, since the toxins are scavenged by glutathione, we'll have a buildup of these toxins, especially the N-acetyl-P-benzoquinone. And so patients who are alcohol drinkers may be at increased risk for hepatic injury when they take Tylenol. So how much of a risk is this? Well, if a patient has a single large alcohol consumption and a single dose of acetaminophen the next day, for example, that's probably okay. And if a patient is a heavy chronic drinker and takes a single dose of acetaminophen, that's also probably okay. Where the problem seems to crop up is in patients who are heavy chronic drinkers and are taking several doses of acetaminophen. These are the patients that are at risk for hepatic necrosis. And the best thing for them to do is to take a lower daily maximum dose, perhaps one to two grams a day maximum dose of acetaminophen. This is a little chart that shows um, it talks about the treatment of Tylenol overdose or Tylenol toxicity. Usually what will happen is if a patient comes in with a Tylenol overdose, they'll start by measuring their serum acetaminophen level and also try to figure out how long ago the ingestion was. So let's say the patient comes in, the level is drawn eight hours after ingestion, and their level comes back at 150. So we would say this patient is in toxicity and should be treated. However, if their level comes back at 50, we would say that they're probably no longer in the toxic zone and don't need any treatment. The treatment is acetylcysteine, and usually if it's given within eight hours of, of the overdose, you may be able to prevent or at least minimize liver injury. Acetaminophen is available orally in regular strength and extra strength tablets. And usually we dose it between 650 and 1,000 milligrams every four to six hours. Like we said, the maximum dose is four grams, some say three grams in 24 hours. We also have IV acetaminophen available called Offermev. The dosing is exactly the same, but the advantage of the IV formulation is that you get a rapid spike in plasma concentration with no first pass effect. So you still have the same four grams per day maximum but now your CNS sees all four of those grams instead of the portion that's taken out by the first pass effect. Scheduled acetaminophen, whether IV or orally, is very helpful to maintain a good plasma concentration and help in patients who are having difficulty controlling their pain. That's it for our discussion about NSAIDs and Tylenol. Please let me know if you have any questions or drop me an email and we'll see you the next time around.